Hey guys, this is John. Welcome to my analysis of round four of the Charlotte Memorial Day weekend rapid event. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> this was an over the board tournament that I played about a week and a half ago as of the time of recording this video. It was played at a time control of 45 minutes with a five second increment. So 45 minutes per side, five seconds added per move. And this was the final round. Yes, we're already at the end of the tournament. It goes by pretty quick when you're playing these games, but in analyzing these and reliving some of the moments, I'm kind of wondering how I got to this 3-0 score in the first place, because if you watch those first three videos, you will know that there was a ton of time pressure, a lot of moments of indecision, some luck along the way, especially in round two. But nonetheless, here I am, final round, sitting on a 3-0 score. And I knew in this tournament that if I was doing well, at some point, I was almost certainly going to play my opponent in this game, who is Grandmaster Alexander Bortnik. Many of you will probably know him if you follow streamers, content creators online. He's a 26-year-old Ukrainian Grandmaster. He's been living in the U.S. for several years now, I believe. He's a chess professional, uh, teaching, making content, as far as I understand, probably very similar to what I do, actually. I didn't know a whole lot about him other than what I've seen with his online play and having played him a few times in Blitz and Bullet over the years. But before I get into the actual game, let me just give you an idea of my mindset heading into this final round. So this is, this is a fairly small field. There's 26 players in the tournament. And Alexander and I were the only two perfect scores going into this final round. So the only 3-0 scores. However, in such a situation, there's often players trailing you by a half point. So there was, I think, one player on two and a half. I should have checked this before I made the video. But I think one player on two and a half out of, th out of three who could potentially catch us if we drew the game, right? So when you're thinking about how you envision your final standings and the prizes, you keep that in mind. If we were a full point clear of the field, that wouldn't matter as much. A draw would, it would be a good result for us in terms of tying for first. But you keep that sort of thing in mind. There's a player a half point back. So my standpoint going into this game, I was not opposed to a draw. I would like to play with a draw in hand. Maybe press for a win, press for an advantage. But if a draw comes up, fine, because that guarantees me a tie for first. But I would like to at least create some pressure and you know not get into some situation where I'm thinking a lot out of the opening as I was doing in some of these games. And it really helps that I had the white pieces here, right? So having white against a GM is very helpful. I had only about 30 minutes before this game started. I was able to look at Alexander's games a little bit in advance. So I brought my laptop to the tournament and I looked up what he plays and I discovered he's kind of an expert in a double fianchetto system we're going to see in this game. But I really didn't have a lot of time to look at it. It was very much a cursory analysis of his opening repertoire, just overall, just the general picture of it. I had in mind the position that I eventually got in this game, but I wasn't able to do any deep analysis. My analysis mostly was going across the street to Starbucks, getting a uh, grande iced Americano and a cheese Danish, <laughs> and hoping that would fuel me for this remaining game. All right, so let's get into this. I opened with knight f3 on move one. This is the tournament that I played. The Sorry, the move I played throughout this tournament. <laughs> knight f3, very flexible. The last round, especially with prizes at stake, the standings of the tournament at stake is not a good time to experiment in, in my experience. So knight f3, Alexander played knight f6. I played c4. So offering some transpositions to English positions. If black wants to play c5, this would be a symmetrical English. There are many different moves black can play here. e6, g6, c6 even, if black wants to try to angle for d5. But Alexander played the move I expected, which was b6. So indicating that he's going for a queenside fianchetto. And I played g3. I'm going to counter fianchetto against his bishop that's coming to b7. So we both play our bishops out, and then he plays g6, indicating this double fianchetto approach. And I faced this line over the board before, but it has been many years. I think it's a very interesting line. Black refuses to occupy the center with pawns, so really playing in hypermodern style, putting the bishops on their longest diagonals, and staying quite flexible, 
really. So I castled here. He played bishop g7. And now I do decide to occupy the center a little more. So I play d4. Pawn to d4. Setting up the c4, d4 duo. Nice central control with these pawns for sure. But we're still well within the book at this point. My opponent castled. And here, I think on a different day with different tournament circumstances, I might have tried the move d5 in this position. Because I think this is the most ambitious move here, looking to block this light square bishop, continuing with knight c3 thereafter. Of course, black may try to chip away at this pawn, but with knight c3 coming, possibly e4 later, I could try to claim that this bishop is out of the game. The downside of d5 is that you do give up control of the c5 square, so black often will angle for that square with the knight. Looking at the database, this seems to be white's best scoring line. In prep preparing for this game, I wasn't seriously considering this approach because, again, Alexander is a big expert in this line. I saw he had dozens of games within this setup. I played this once against a good opponent, the, the setup overall, and not even this d5 move. So I wanted to play it a little closer to the vest. So I, I played the most natural move here. I think it is, in fact, the most popular move. Yeah, looking in the database, it is the most popular move. And it was knight c3. So bringing my other knight into the game. And Alexander played knight e4. Jumping his knight to the center. And this is one of the principal ideas behind this pattern of development for black. They're waiting for white to play knight c3 to go knight e4 which forestalls any attempt by white to get their pawn to the e4 square. So let's say, for example, black had instead played e6 or, or d6. Let's say d6. White may play queen c2, and then on some further routine developing move, knight bd7, white can expand with e4 because white has the knight and the queen, both defending the square. And this is where probably the central control that black is giving up and this bishop getting buried somewhat is going to work against black. This kind of looks like a bad King's Indian. Black does have elements of a King's Indian position, but not the normal counterplay associated with a King's Indian. So the timing of knight e4 is crucial for black in this line. I think it's fair to say without this move, this wouldn't be a very good setup for black. But they're waiting to play it at the moment that they can offer a trade and look to double my pawns if I allow it. So... Black sent that knight to the center. There's a further split here. Just theoretically, white has played bishop d2, queen c2 if they want to defend the knight. But most players play the move that I played, which is just knight takes e4. So trading the knights. Knight takes e4, bishop takes e4. And now I played bishop e3. Again, the most popular move in this position. So although this looks like a bit of an awkward square for the bishop, it does reinforce the d4 pawn. And it looks to perhaps continue with queen d2 in many cases where white can build up around that central pawn, free up the d1 square for a rook to come to, and possibly play bishop h6 later and try to trade for this dark square bishop. So I know that seems like an unusual square blocking the e-pawn, but it's not like the e-pawn's going to do too much damage in the short term. So I'm mostly just looking to develop and get my pieces into the game. So no issues with time yet or anything. We're on move nine here. I was more or less out of book coming up. So Alexander played the move d5 at this point. I vaguely remembered a couple ideas here, but I didn't have concrete knowledge of how to proceed. So this move offers a trade of pawns in the center. Black's kind of indicating that they're willing to dig in uh, in the middle of the board at this point. They're not going to just let me slowly improve my position with moves like this. They're making me think how I'm going to deal with the tension between these pawns. So I reacted to this move with not capturing the pawn, but playing queen a4. So developing the queen and having the queen defend c4. And I kind of like this move. Even now, it seems harmonious to me. So I am pretty satisfied with that. Alexander took on c4, and I recaptured with my queen. And now his knight came to c6. And this too seems to be a common pattern of development for black in this line. Once the bishop has established itself on e4 by means of that trade, 
you can expect to see this knight come to c6 with more frequency versus the bishop still on b7 with the knight coming to c6 blocking it. That's not as harmonious for black as this one. So I think a pretty interesting setup for black. Conventionally, I do feel white has a bit of an advantage here. I have the one pawn established in the center, which is very well protected. I kind of get the sense the c7 pawn could be backward. But black has relatively few weaknesses. I'd say mainly just this diagonal and arguably the lack of pawn play in the center that I can point to. But aside from that, black has a coherent position. At this point, I play the move rook fd1. So bringing a rook to the d-file, backing up my d-pawn, also eyeing up this black queen on d8, kind of x-raying it. I think it's more ambitious, though, to play rook ac1. This is what the engine was recommending afterwards. And if I could do this over, I probably would play this here. This ensures that if the knight were to move in the future, I could take this pawn. So puts a little bit of pressure. If black tries to back my queen off, I can maybe just play queen a4 and introduce rook takes c6 as a threat even. I kind of suspect he would have met this move with queen d5, which may end up looking somewhat similar to the game. But I have some extra options. I won't go too deep here in the interest of keeping things kind of clean. But uh, knight e1 is one move that the computer was potentially recommending here, looking for a swap of the bishops and a swap of the queens even with perhaps some residual pressure here down the file. I think this could also result in um, some interesting play. Black could play, try knight d8 here. And then on rook takes c7, try to send the knight to e6 and fork. But I am scooping a pawn, and black may not get enough compensation in a line like this. So this is just one potential line the engine was spitting out at me afterwards. Not necessarily forced, but interesting that, that white can think about playing this way with knight e1 and looking to break up this, this strong play that black has on this diagonal. So I think that was more ambitious, but I played this solid move rook fd1. And he responded with queen d5. And at this point, I knew I had a decision to make in terms of keeping the queen's honor off the board. Queen a4, if I want to avoid a queen trade, didn't quite look right to me. I think that could lead to a much more complicated fight. But I didn't see a clear way to break this up. Maybe I could try for knight e1 in the future, but it seems a little odd to play queen a4, queen takes c4, and then queen back to a4. And more or less admit that black's queen d5 move was good in backing off the queen. I didn't want to initiate the trade myself. I would rather black initiate the trade. So at this point, I played rook a c1. I back up my queen. And Alexander took the queen. So queen takes c4. We get a trade. And then he played bishop d5. Hitting the rook. I saw all of this. Even though this x-rays my pawn down on a2, I wasn't concerned because I knew this bishop would have to stay guarding the knight. So I played rook c3. Interesting move that the computer points out. I don't think I considered it really at all in the game is knight d2. Doesn't, doesn't seem to affect the evaluation much, but this allows bishop takes c4. And the idea is actually just to recapture, banking on the fact that this pressure will allow white to regain the material. So the engine was giving something like knight b4, bishop takes a8, rook takes a8, with rough equality. Because this pawn's under attack, the knight may reposition here, materials back to equal. So an idea I didn't consider, but kind of an intriguing way to try to uh, trade the bishops or encourage black to actually take on c4. But I played rook c3, and I went to c3 because I thought... I might be able to double up the rooks. I don't want to go back to c1 with my rook that's on c4 and um, not have that option. So I thought rook c3 looking to double would be useful. If I go to c2 instead, knight b4 is in the air. So I don't like that as much. And on rook c3, he responded with rook a d8. Useful move. This escapes potential pressure down this long diagonal and backs up the bishop and introduces further pressure on d4. And at this point, I kind of saw how the game would very likely continue. I played rook d to c1, which I think is by far my most natural move, threatening the knight on c6, 
And here, Alexander played bishop takes f3. So giving the light square bishop, and with this move, he offered a draw. We're on move 16. He offered the draw. And I thought for mm, maybe about two minutes, and I took the draw. I won't leave you guys in suspense. I took the draw here. <laughs> and I, I saw that this was going to get simplified. Let's say I play bishop takes f3, although I did briefly consider e takes f3. Turns out that's not very good. But bishop takes f3, knight takes d4. Remember, there's no pin on this knight anymore, so knight takes d4. And here there's a couple different routes. I can either play rook takes c7 or bishop takes d4. If bishop takes d4, we get into an opposite color bishop situation. I do regain the pawn, but black takes on b2. I figured this was almost certainly going to be drawn, something like bishop a3 defending e7. I can pick off this pawn on a7, bishop c5. It's five pawns each, opposite color bishops. Yeah, this rook is marginally more active than any rook black has, but that's, that's not enough to do damage in these positions. The engine is showing triple zeros here, so completely equal. So could play bishop takes d4 and angle for that, but I do think that leads to a fairly easy draw. Rook takes c7 was the move I was more seriously considering, because then after knight takes f3 check, pawn takes f3, we're at least in the same color bishop position. But taking this a little further, bishop takes b2, rook c2. Here, black is up a pawn, and although they will have to give a pawn back, I didn't think I could pressure much from here. So, for example, bishop d4 is pretty solid in this position. We could have a trade of bishops, and then I take my, my choice as to which pawn to pick off. Perhaps I have a bit of pressure here. There's even some rook endings. This is just some engine analysis where white may go up a pawn, but it's very, very difficult to win with white having some weaknesses and the rook not being particularly active. Moreover, I think in this position here, if it were to reach this, black probably doesn't even need to play bishop d4. Bishop f6 looks decent, defending this pawn here. Rook takes a7 and then b5. The engine thinks this is pretty much equal as well. So it's the type of thing, if I were playing a lower rated player or I was in a must win situation, I would have played on here, but with a draw guaranteeing uh, at least a tie for first with my opponent and maybe one other person who was playing a higher rated player, by the way. So I was sort of pricing in that they might, might lose or draw. I was happy to take a draw here. It was a lot of chess, a lot of stress that I was dealing with in the previous games. So happy to, to call it even and um, ultimately share the first first uh, prizes with Alexander. Ole uh, I keep calling him Alexander, but it's actually Alexander, even though it starts with an, an O. So Bishop takes F3, we called it a draw. A little anticlimactic, I know. I was thinking how I was going to present this video because the game itself like wasn't that exciting. I was happy that I got a position I had briefly looked at, but we never really got a full-fledged fight. I think this rook ac1 move might have kept more tension and interest in the game, but rook fd1 allowing queen d5 and then the very quick queen trade where it seemed like black was just in time to solve any remaining issues, I think does kill a lot of the playoff. Okay, so... That one ended relatively uh, rapidly. My score sheet indicates 27 minutes for me remaining in the final position on Bishop takes F3 and 32 minutes for Alexander. Turns out that player who was a half point behind lost their game. So they didn't end up tying. And Alexander and I split the first and second places and we got $375 each. So always nice to come away from a tournament with uh, some money in your pocket. Here are the final standings. If you're curious, this is the cross table. So this event was dual rated. It was USCF regular rated and also quick rated. So here you can see three and a half points each. I won't go through how to read a cross table at this point, but I will link to this if you want to take a look at it. So I ended up gaining one USCF rating point, <laughs> one very hard fought point. Gained a few quick rating 
Although I subsequently lost some quick rating in the event the next day, which was a 10 plus three event followed by a blitz event. Shout out to my opponent from round two, by the way, Jacob. He won his last two games. So he finished with a strong three out of four score. Also, Anthony Parker, who was my round three opponent, he drew his final round against a good player, by the way, underrated player. He finished with two and a half. So thank you guys for following my analysis and my journey in this first over-the-board event for me in about three and a half years. Yeah, I was happy with the performance. It would have been nice to push further for a win against this Grandmaster in the last round. It's always interesting to play Grandmasters. But I think I made a decent call. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with the result, especially how I achieved it with lots of um, topsy-turvy games, stress-inducing games. Now, before I leave, let me give you guys a little tactic from the 10 plus 3 Rapid event that I played the next day. I'm not going to cover that tournament because I don't have the game scores for most of the games, being a 10-minute with a 3-second increment tournament. But let me show you a position and give you a little bit of a puzzle. Okay. So this was played against Fide Master Vishnu Vanapali. I believe he's local to the Charlotte area. So Charlotte, born and raised player. And I've seen him progress over the years. He's, I think, 16 years old. And as I found out in this game, quite sharp tactically, as a lot of these young players are. So we were in the waning moments of this 10 plus 3 rapid game. I got to say, I kind of liked playing the rapid games at the faster time control. So 10 plus 3 and then the blitz games at 3 plus 2 after having just played the game in 45 event because it forced me to play quicker. <laughs> so even though I got in time pressure in some of those games, I couldn't just think forever as I could in the game 45s and then try to play the remainder of the game in a rush. So it was kind of nice like having the time control actually push you a little bit after those longer games. So it was white to move here. Vishnu playing white. I'm playing black. He played the move queen c5 in this position. We got an interesting little imbalance. I have one extra pawn, but white has the two minor pieces against my rook, rook and pawn, essentially. Yeah, that's right. Isn't it five pawns for me, four pawns for white? So queen c5 was played. I have an issue with the rook where if I don't do something quickly, white's going to play queen b6 and try to attack it. Maybe queen d6 as well. Try to dislodge this rook. But I played the move queen a2 in reply to queen c5. This threatens a checkmate on g2. I should mention at this point, we have about 30 seconds each. I think he had 30. I had maybe, actually probably even less, like 20-ish, I want to say. So I played queen a2, threatening checkmate. Always nice to do that to try to slow your opponent down. And here, white should play the move knight f3. Back off the knight and try to block the mate that way. This keeps an advantage for white. But Vishnu played bishop f2. Blocking the queen on the second rank. But this is the moment, or the move that I was hoping for. I responded with queen a1 check. Forking the king and the knight. And at this point, I'm thinking, all right, I got him. This game was complicated up until this point. So I'm winning a clean piece here. Let's go. King h2 is the answer. And this all happened in the blink of an eye. Queen takes e5 check. Bishop g3. And I hadn't fores foreseen this last move here, bishop g3, when I played queen a2, by the way. I saw the fork potential. I saw the win of the knight. This move escaped my attention. So now I have to adjust a little bit because I realize he's skewering my queen to my rook. So the game is not over. But I quickly do realize that I can threaten mate on g2 again. Okay, so I play the move queen e2, linking up with my bishop to threaten queen takes g2 checkmate. Now bishop takes c7 is basically impossible for white. And in, in a flash, I really give my opponent credit for this, instantly, Vishnu played queen takes d5. Which it took me just a couple seconds to recover from this shock that this move was played, and he played it very confidently too, <laughs> to his credit. Queen takes bishop on d5. Great practical choice. Because if white plays something like queen f2, I'm very happy to trade queens and then pick off the pawn on c6. This is an easy win, right? 
Bishop f2, I think, will also not be any trouble there. So queen takes d5, bamboozled me for a couple seconds. Of course, I took the queen. And then he took my rook on c7, because now there's no mate on g2. Now, here you go. Here's your quiz. What should black do here? And remember, you got about 10 seconds on your clock to decide. Black to move. Forgot to tell you to pause your video, but let me drink my coffee while you do that, if you haven't already. Okay, so this little snippet of this game is a great example of the emotions that you experience in the course of a game, especially an over-the-board game. Somehow the emotional toll is just higher when you're playing over the board. The clock is physically ticking or counting down next to you on the board. You're looking at your opponent. There might be spectators around. All of those elements just add to the tension, even compared to online time scrambles, which are already stressful enough. So on bishop takes c7, I saw white's idea. They have the two bishops, but most importantly, they have this super strong c-pawn, right? And it's two squares away from promotion. Simply put, white is going to back this bishop out, probably to g3, where it's anchored, defended by the king. Push c7. And then c8 queen. And white's going to challenge me to find some way to stop that because that pawn will be ushered through with the fence the entire time by the dark square bishop and then queening on a protected square, protected by the light square bishop. And I, I really wonder, I wish I could put players around my rating or even higher in this situation with this amount of time, roughly 10 seconds, let's call it. And I wonder how many of them would figure out a defense here because I failed, guys. I, I did not figure out a defense. And it turns out there are multiple, but that was only obvious after I had already lost. <laughs> so I think probably the best defense is to play d4 here, which I actually did play. And then on bishop g3, go for this backwards pin of the c-pawn. So queen e4. This is, I think, an elegant way to deal with the threat of c7. So now if the pawn is pushed, we can just take the bishop, the bishop's unprotected, and we're guarding the queenie square. And it's like, what does white do after this queenie four move? There's no good move to usher this pawn along. You can't defend this bishop further. I'm also ready to move my d-pawn up the board, by the way. Queen is really nicely centralized. Black is winning here, no problem. Notice bishop a8 doesn't help. c7 is still not a threat. So we would take and defend here, so black wins. So queen e4 after d4 is a clean one. I could also realistically play uh, queen b5. So observing the pawn from behind. Again, idea of c7, queen takes b7. I think even queen b2 is working here. Same concept. I need to do something to attack the bishop before the pawn moves or pin the pawn, as we saw with this queen e4 move. But alas, I was not able to figure that out. I played the move d3 in the game. I think I flagged as I played this move, actually, so I ran out of time as this move was executed. We played a couple more moves, though. Uh, he didn't notice that I had lost on time. So we got to this position, and I think right around here he called my flag, so the game was over. But it is losing. Even though my pawn was one square away from promotion, white was promoting with check, and the position is pretty easily winning for white after this. Number of ways to win. For example, queen c2 check, and then bishop f3 on the next move, which will conveniently allow white to guard the queening square. Something like this, let's say. And I'm down too much material. So I thought that was an interesting moment, even though I lost this game. It was an unusual pattern. I think that's why I had a hard time seeing this in the moment. I can't recall too many circumstances where I've pinned a pawn backwards to prevent it from moving forward to promotion. So the unusual nature, nature of this idea was not something that I was able to, to grasp in the moment. Although I did mention it to him like right after the game. So as I, as I played D3 and D2, my mind is already starting to work thinking like where I could have played better just a move or two ago. That's, that's how painful losses work in chess, right? <laughs> Interestingly, one final note on this. So queen e2, I think, is a bit of a practical error, although I, I even hesitate to call it as such. Had I played queen e4, which also links up with the bishop, 
and threatens mate on g2. I think I would have found this idea by default because on queen takes d5, I think I would have been more likely to play queen takes d5 because it's now actually an option compared to the game where it wasn't. <laughs> Anticipating this whole thing happening, I could see myself understanding after this move is played what white is going for and considering my options, of which I have two, and already putting myself in this favorable pin backwards versus the game where queen e2, queen takes d5, I have no choice but to take on, on d5. I can't get cute here and do something like this. It's going to fail. So just funny how this stuff works with little time on the clock. And kudos to those of you who are able to orient yourself, especially if you um, were taking my, my self-imposed time limit advice and trying to solve this within about 10 seconds. All right, so an interesting concluding moment from this game. Once again, thank you for following my analysis. I know this was some detailed analysis throughout this event. Seems like you guys like this. I don't have plans to play over the board anytime soon again, but I will try to do some further deep dives because I, I learn a lot in going through these games. I really enjoy it, and I hope um, you guys have enjoyed it and learned some stuff as well. So let me know if you have any feedback or comments, and I'll see you guys in the next video.